So in this episode of the 10 minute podcast I am going to be discussing whether top 4 is over for Manchester United and whether Arsenal will slip up in the race for the top 4. I'll also talk about why BLs have failed at Leeds whilst also discussing how long it will take for Newcastle to become a top side challenging for the top 4 and for the title and I'll also be pointing out some players who come the summer could be available for significantly reduced prices from what they would otherwise be worth. But before I go any further for cheap good quality football jerseys, retro jerseys and tracksuits go over to www.jerseyfever.com I myself have bought a number of different jerseys from Jersey Fever including this 2003-2004 Manchester United shirt with Ronaldo on the back and this one's probably my favourite so if you want a shirt like this be sure to click the link in the description below and use code AlantisFootball with a space to get 5% off. So let's start off with the race for the top four and it does seem like Arsenal are in pole position. So Manchester United are 47 points, West Ham are 45, with Arsenal also on 45 points and Tottenham just behind them with 42 points. However, the significant thing about this is that Arsenal do have three games in hand on both Manchester United and West Ham, whilst Tottenham have played one more game than Arsenal and two less than West Ham and Manchester United. So that does mean that if Arsenal and Tottenham were both to win all of their games in hands, which probably won't happen particularly for Tottenham, then Arsenal would be seven points clear of Manchester United and six of Tottenham who would be ahead of both Manchester United and West Ham. So Arsenal have to be the firm favourites, particularly with how they've been playing. They seem to be in a great run of form of recent. Tottenham I'm less certain about because they do seem to be dropping points left, right and centre. And so without doubt it is Arsenal's to lose. However, I do still think that Manchester United and West Ham are still in this race and this is because Arsenal do have 14 games left. They've only played 24 and to think that they're going to go on a run where they win even say 10 of those games is pretty unlikely. And if you look at the teams they've still got to play, they've still got to play Liverpool at home, Manchester United at home, Aston Villa away, West Ham away, Crystal Palace away and Brighton at home I think it is. And I think everyone would agree that all of those games are potential games where Arsenal could drop points. Particularly if you look at Liverpool, that's kind of a write-off. A uh, Manchester United game, if Manchester United could win that, then obviously uh, that completely changes the dynamic. They've also got to go to West Ham. Um, and, and so Arsenal, there's still plenty of opportunities for them to drop points. And you've also got to factor in that they have been in a great run of form, but how long is that form going to last? Is it going to last the last 14 games of the season? Or are they going to eventually hit a blip as in the same way that both West Ham and Manchester United have? So I don't think it's anywhere near done. I would say that Arsenal are favourites. I would put Manchester United second favourites. Um, and then Tottenham and West Ham are still they're very inconsistent Tottenham I think uh, do look like a side who once they clear a few mistakes out of their game which may come with a bit more consistency from their defensive players and I could see them equally getting into the race as much as Manchester United and um, Arsenal as well but if I had to make a prediction on who's going to finish top four I don't think it would go Arsenal Manchester United I think probably maybe will slip up Manchester United just seem to be slipping up just as much as Tottenham as well so you've got to factor that in as well Manchester United also have the Champions League so I would probably bank on Arsenal getting top four Manchester United fifth maybe West Ham sixth and Tottenham seventh so now we are on to the news that Marcelo Bielsa has been sacked as Leeds manager which kind of isn't a surprise if you look at their recent form they've been getting absolutely thumped um, this week especially losing to Liverpool, Tottenham and Manchester United but even before that they got absolutely smashed by Manchester City and it did seem like the writing was on the wall and they were just getting closer and closer to the relegation zone but a lot of people will be wondering why did it just go so terribly for Bielsa after all when he got uh, Leeds promoted they were one of the clubs that was tipped to be pushing into the top 10 and a team that most people were excited about However, what we saw with Bielsa at Leeds was a similar pattern to what we had seen with him at other clubs, particularly if you, if you think about Athletic Bilbao, uh, Marseille, clubs like that. It didn't seem to last as long as maybe you would uh, hope, especially for a manager who'd been touted as such a great inventor of a certain philosophy and style. But the problem with Bielsa is not just a personality one, he can be a bit fiery, which um, has been which did cause issues at other clubs, but but at Leeds that wasn't really the problem. The problem was firmly on the pitch, um, and if you watch Leeds play, you'd see that they were pressing still very aggressively. It wasn't like they changed style, um, but the problem it does stem from their pressing. If you watch my video where I analysed the Manchester United Leeds game, um, I basically described how um, Leeds use a very aggressive man-to-man pressing system. Usually you see sides press um, man-to-man high up the pitch, but not as a 
diligently and not as strictly as Leeds do, where each player is essentially man-marking the player they're assigned to and following them wherever they go on the pitch, even if this does drag them out of positions. And this happens quite a lot, particularly against big sides. Uh, teams are quite easily able to manoeuvre around Leeds, drag their central midfield out of position and then break into the space that, that's been vacated in the centre of midfield. And it's no surprise that whenever McTominay, over the over past few games, has played against Leeds... Um, if we think about earlier on this season, and I think there was a game last season as well, he um, was brilliant at just um, running straight through the Leeds midfield. And that's a problem that Leeds had, particularly against big sides, because when you're pressing against smaller sides, you can catch them out. They may decide to go long. You can win the ball back. But if you're going to uh, do that sort of pressing against Liverpool, against Manchester City, against Man United, Chelsea, etc., um, those sides are going to be able to play out of your press. And more often than not, it's going to leave your whole system exposed. And that's why Leeds have conceded the most goals of any side in the league this season. They've got the second highest expected goals against as well. So it's pretty expected that they are going to lose games, particularly with the injuries they've had. Bamford's been missing. They've underperformed their XG as well. So it's, if you were a betting man and you had some foresight at the start of the season, I think most people could have predicted this would happen, particularly with the whole um, COVID situation with players missing. Leeds have absolutely been like ransacked with injuries as well, which hasn't helped. And when you've got these players fluctuating, uh, fluctuating in and out of the side, new players coming into the system, not only does it take a while for the whole uh, side to adapt tactically, but you're also losing that individual quality. And that's obviously going to make a difference, particularly in the attacking third. And I think this is a great illustration of why Bielsa hasn't maybe hit the heights that some people would have expected in, in his career. I think whilst managers have been influenced by him, they have sort of um, adapted that style into a more pragmatic way of playing, particularly at the top level. And it'll be interesting to see where, where Bielsa goes next. I don't think he'll get another job in England. Um, he may do, uh, but I think it's unlikely. I think we will see him in either Spain or maybe back in South America. I could even see that as well. So another question that was asked was, how long will it take for Newcastle to become a top side? Now, originally when they got taken over, um, uh, every, the the kind of um, talk around Newcastle was that they were instantly going to be challenging for top four. They were going to be the next Man City, next Chelsea. I just don't see that happening, well, at least not in the next three to five years. If, if I had to give it a timeline, I'd say next season, they're still going to be bottom half. I would say the season after, maybe mid-table. Uh, season after that, they could be pushing top six. I think season by season, they're going to gradually improve. That is if they buy, if they are smart in the transfer window. We've seen what Manchester City did um, in their first two seasons. They spent a load of money. They didn't really make the progress that they would make until they started actually bringing in quality players in positions they actually needed until they got Roberto Mancini in place. I don't think Eddie Howe's the manager to take Newcastle um, into those European positions. I see him being kind of like Mark Hughes, a manager who will be a bit of a who will stabilise the club, keep him in the Premier League, maybe build a bit of a foundation. But I, I can't see him lasting more than three seasons at Newcastle. I think eventually, what will happen is Newcastle will, will begin to stagnate. I reckon next season they could maybe finish mid-table, but I don't see them even competing for the for European places for the next three seasons at least. And um, that is really because I just don't trust their transfer policy. Bruno Guimaraes was a great signing, but I was concerned with the signing of Chris Wood. Um, yes, he is there to keep them in the Premier League, but it just smacks of um, mid-table transfer strategy. And I think Eddie Howe is does bring that a lot and that's why I would be concerned if I was a Newcastle fan. Maybe not concerned because I think they will stay up particularly this season but to, I, I just don't see them even challenging for the top four until maybe 2026, 20, maybe that season. But I, I, would put, I would put a lot of money on Newcastle not winning the Premier League for this decade at least. So now let's come on to some players who I think big clubs have to be interested in this summer. Um, and most of it is due to their contract situation or their lack of playing time at their current club. So Serge Gnabry, he's one I've spoken about in regards to Manchester United. He's probably the biggest player on the market, apart from the players who have contracts expiring uh, this summer, like Mbappe and Pogba. But I did do a separate video about those players, which will be linked in the description. But Serge Gnabry has one year left on his contract. I reckon a big side could get him for between 50 and 60 million pounds, which is an absolute steal for a player of his quality. Emilian Skriniar is, is another player in that situation, Yuri Tielemans as well, even Robert Lewandowski who is 33, close to being 34. But I think even if you had to pay 30, 40, 
45 million pounds for him. I still think he's going to have at least one more insane season. And the level he's producing at the moment is going to instantly make whatever side he goes to, Champions League and Premier League contenders, or if he doesn't go to the Premier League, La Liga, Serie A, wherever he goes, contenders for those leagues. Yuri Tielemans is another one at Leicester who's got a contract uh, expiring in the summer of 2023. I think for maybe 40 million you'd get him, which most big clubs should be looking at. Same with um, Koulibaly at Napoli. He is 30, but he's such a good defender. And defenders do tend to last longer in their career. So I think he would be another good pickup for any top side. I still think he's a top five centre-back in the world. Um, he'd be a great option as well. Um, who else we got? We've got players like uh, Riyad Mahrez, who is in a similar situation. He is 31, which obviously he's going to put a lot of clubs off. But I still think... You saw what Iron Robin and Frank Ribery did uh, into their thirties, into their mid thirties. So um, I think Mahrez could be a good option for maybe a side like Juventus, maybe Bayern Munich. So definitely, um, those players I've suggested are probably the big ones that you would be looking out for. And every top club should be looking at players whose contracts are coming to an end because they are the players that are going to have the best value for money, in my opinion.